Welcome again, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, you can support these programs by joining the YouTube channel directly at multiple levels or hitting patreon.com slash Aksum. Today, my guest is Jeff Pierce, and I've been chided, Jeff, by some of my audience for either... Uh, I try to be Cronkite-ish as possible and not editorialize, but sometimes I do, or sometimes I just... Uh, ignore the subject. I assume a good portion of my audience would know you, but probably a good portion wouldn't. How would you introduce yourself? Um, timidly. Um, <laughs> are, are, are you saying that you're getting into trouble for having me on or I'm not understanding? No, your no, 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 no. I get into trouble for not giving enough background information on guests, like when I introduce them, because oh. there are people who you don't know when they're tuning in. They're like random in the audience and they're like, oh, why don't you give them a thorough introduction? And for me, I try to not editorialize and let people introduce themselves as much as possible so that they can describe themselves in their own words as opposed to my projections of them. Oh, well, that's interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> is that a novel idea? Yeah, it is. Uh, well, that, that leads to a certain amount of conceit on the part of your guest. Because the thing yeah. is, um, I'm nobody, really. I mean, the thing is, I'm a hack writer who's written several books. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, who is also fighting a cold. Um, and it's what I always want to do. I went to journalism, but I went to journalism back in a day when that was considered a way to get yourself into writing novels or to write mm -hmm. books. I always wanted to write books. Um, if people are watching your podcast, they probably know me from my work on Ethiopia, whether it be Prevail, the book about the Italian Second Italian Ethiopian War, or they might know me from my new book called The Gifts of Africa, which is available in stores uh, now through Amazon and others. Um, with regard to some of the things that we'll be discussing today, um, I hold or held rather, um, a knee Dan second degree black belt in Shotokan karate, which was bestowed on me by my, my, by my sensei, Gary Lynch and, uh, sensei Miguel Palo Pacino, who is now departed both of uh, Hoko Dojo. Um, so I trained in Shotokan karate. I was also the, an editor for, I don't even remember because it was ages ago back in the nineties. I was either the associate, the assistant editor of Canadian martial arts magazine. Amazing. Um, but that's a bygone age. Um, and as we've just discovered, I'm from Winnipeg and you just unfortunately had to do time in North Dakota yes. for which you have my sincerest sympathies <laughs> <laughs> thank you and i, 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 mean, I can pick, pick a couple times well i can pick on north dakota i don't give a damn like they're not gonna come after me like i'm all the way on the east coast so. yeah the one thing i appreciated about them i'll say is the uh whatever sort of rebellious spirit there were of some of the farmers they uh mass protested the parking meters and so they um abolished all parking meters uh very shortly before i i got there and it was just something nice that i didn't have to think about and I was like, okay, I appreciate, I can appreciate, I try to find something I could appreciate. Cause, cause God forbid we shouldn't have like tax revenue from parking. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> like, what the hell is that? <laughs> anyway, it's your show, dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Either yeah, it, I, I hope, uh, am I the first to ever talk to you publicly about martial arts? And I do want to get into that, but I think Ethiopia would be a better starting place. You might be, you might be the first, I love talking about martial arts and I miss it tremendously. You might be the first person to ask me about martial arts publicly in something like 20 years. Right. Um, because, uh, just as a bit of background, um, a few years ago, just a handful of years ago, um, I wrote a column called Legend of a Sensei, which was uh, very pop. Well, for then it had popular numbers on medium, not like my Ethiopian journalism, mm -hmm. but um, there had my, my sensei died. He died in front of us uh, of a heart attack. Uh, mm -hmm. And ironically, he was something like 50 years old. He was just mm -hmm. like an incredible guy. And I can tell you more about that. I guess we're segueing into martial arts rather than Ethiopia. But the thing is, this guy was amazing. And he was amazing on multiple levels because most people brag about their sensei, their instructors, and they talk about, oh, my instructor can do this physical feat, blah, blah. That's yeah. not the way we measured it. We measured it in terms of how our students did. And this is a guy who trained in multiple arts and knew the history of the art. He could look at a forum and tell you where that form came from. 
and what country and the Tremendous. background and the history. He was a scholar as well as, you know, he had a degree in physical education, but he was a advanced uh, Shotokan karate practitioner. He was an advanced instructor in Tai, in tai Chi Chuan. He knew Aikijitsu. He learned boxing. He went and learned commando knife fighting from a French resistance guerrilla fighter. Wow. He knew weapons. He was a walking bomb. And and added to that, he was also a lay Buddhist priest uh, to a degree, which is another story. But the thing is, the guy was amazing. Like he was, he was so close to the matrix. <laughs> he, mm -hmm. You know, you wouldn't even, you, my, my other teacher, Gary Lynch once told us a story where all, all he had to do was block in terms of Miguel coming from a distance of the span of the dojo to get in. Miguel crossed the dojo three times, you know, in your face, <laughs> boom, scored. And wow. I said, I said to Gary, how do you do it? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. His, his leg would move in a blur and then move around <laughs> in a blur. And he once did that where he was saying, and you can do this, 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 this. And I'm standing there with one of the other students. And we're just staring at each other going, he's moving faster than we can follow. <laughs> You're just, it was like, there was no matrix movie at the time, but you know, the blurring part, yeah. the, that's how fast he could move. And he, or died. any anime. Yeah. Any or anime any anime. Too, and yeah. he died before he died before there was DVDs really were mm -hmm. common. He died before there was a lot of, there has been some limited video footage on VHS taken of them. That's been put, slapped up on the internet on youtube to a degree but it doesn't do justice it's from his early years it doesn't do justice to him at his full strength and if you're not talking about your teacher in martial arts i really worry about anyone <laughs> who well no because this is this is what we do and yeah. in the same way that one can appreciate ethiopian history or ethiopian music or ethiopian you know if you want to study Gi's manuscripts Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. You have to bring back a love and devotion to the original instructors and to the texts and yeah. go back. We were chatting online and you did a tweet in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've forgotten the content, but it was on uh, Jigoro Kano. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is cool. Here's yeah. an Ethiopian guy, a diaspora guy talking about judo. And Jigoro Kano was one of the uh, sponsors in terms of helping Gichin Funakochi, the mo mo founder of Modern Karate Do, uh, spread the art from Okinawa to Japan, which at the time were considered two separate entities around mm -hmm. the turn of the 20th century. These guys were pals, you know? And then you got Gozo Shioda, who later, you know, he was sent by... Uh, uh, Jigoro Kano say, hey, go check out this guy, Morihai Washiba. Go down to the Aiki, Aikido Dojo and check it out. Goes to Shioda, checks it out and goes, well, this is cool. And then doesn't come back. <laughs> like wow. he basically, basically says, well, yeah, I'm going to study this now. Bye. <laughs> and like they got that going on. So all these guys knew each other. And it's just amazing. Like, and I've never seen a book on, maybe I'll write it one day. I've never seen a book on how all of these guys knew and respected each other and you had a golden age of martial arts around the turn of the 20th century up until what would you say maybe the second world war and after mm -hmm. the second world war you know so yeah exciting stuff yeah and you said that was the the ethos or the spirit of the magazine that you used to work on in canada was a sort of respectful yeah. display of these uh founders who are contemporaries of yeah. one another yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll try to show it as clear as possible, but this is the magazine that came out in the 90s. It was um, full full credit um, to the person who, who edited it. It was the brainchild of a lovely woman called Josanth LaRue, who I believe now lives out in BC. We sort of lost touch. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> we, we were the skeptical ones, uh, the friend... My friend and I who slaying St. Bruce. Yeah, well, it, well, I'll go into that in just a second. But the thing is, um, she said, well, we want to do a martial arts. She wants to do a martial mm -hmm. arts magazine. We said, well, it's Canada. Like Canada can be a graveyard for magazines to an extent, unless they're owned by major publishers, because we have such a tiny population. We're the second biggest country in the world. 
yet I think last I checked, we have something like 36, 37 million people. And back wow. then we would have had in the nineties, maybe, excuse me, 32 to 35 million. And of that, how many people, you know, are, are martial arts practitioners. And yet she somehow made it work. We managed to make it work for, I think, close to a year. The thing about this article is, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I was annoyed because there was a, a biopic about Bruce Lee that came out and it was nonsense in terms of fictionalizing his life. Mm -hmm. And Bruce Lee started off as a street thug in Hong Kong. He was a ne'er-do-well. He was a pain in the ass. Like they had sent him actually to California because it was like, you're getting into trouble. Like at one point, uh, if memory serves, he had a fight where he beat the hell out of the guy so much that he lost his eye. Wow. Uh, use of his eye. Yeah, he was a rough I never knew that guy. part. Wow. Yeah. So the thing is, he gets, and later on when he was, there's an infamous tale of when you see Enter the Dragon, which people, mm -hmm. there are certain martial artists who rave about this movie. Well, number one, it's a ripoff of a James Bond film. It's not a bad movie, but it's kind of ridiculous. But there's a sequence in it where he's fighting Bob Wall. And to paraphrase the story very quickly, Bob Wall uh, cheats on the fight. He loses the fight. And then to show he's such a bad villain, he breaks a bottle and has to attack uh, Bruce Lee. Bob Wall breaks a wall, big breaks a bottle and realizes, oh my, holy shit, pardon my language. You're fine. This, this is, this isn't candy glass. This is real glass. Like these guys are not using proper plot, prop, props. And so he goes at Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee gets, you know, as my team, as my sensei used to say, even monkeys fall from trees. He got scored on, mm -hmm. uh, and got hurt. And Bruce Lee got pissed off so badly that he side thrust kick Bob Wall back against the line of extras. And one guy fell and broke his arm. Oh my God. Yeah. Now that is not the behavior and conduct <laughs> of a guy who's supposed to be like a saint in terms of, yeah. and on the plus side, um, the, he, you know, that was one of his bad days on a bear day, uh, in the fight that was depicted in dragon, which was just early ridiculous. It didn't happen the way it was supposed to, uh, the way it actually happened in dragon. He appears in this like inner sanctum and he's like fighting with these guys and robes above. It's such horseshit. What actually happened was the real opponent was sent by the traditionalists and he shows up with a scroll. And this guy was actually apologetic. And he said, gee, I'm really sorry. They chose me to fight you. I don't really want to mm -hmm. do this, but they're calling you out. They think your Jeet Kune Do is bullshit. Like, I'm sorry, I got to do this. And you're, and Bruce Lee fights him, beats him. And that's what inspired him to really perfect Jeet Kune Do. Cause he said, this fight shouldn't have taken as long as it did. And so that's to me far more interesting than the bullshit where they say, oh, yeah. he broke his back. And, and that's not what happened. He, he never got his back broken in that fight. So the article is sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> inspired there, but we did our, our sort of, um, and by the way, there's a portrayal of that. I think yeah. more accurate, like the kind of the yeah, way you were movie? portraying him. And I think yeah. once upon a time in Hollywood, if you saw it in which people complained on the other side that he was kind of looked down upon and um, made to look a little sillier than he was, but he was yeah. definitely more the way that you're describing it in once upon a time in Hollywood. Well, I, I take great issue with that movie. I also have a, a severe I have an extreme hatred of Tarantino on mm -hmm. a, on a creative level because Tarantino's thing is just as a quick tangent tarantino's thing is violence yeah um and it's splatter violence and the thing is um it, may, it might be kind of ironic for me as a white person to say this to a black man in america but the thing is when you do a movie where you make the uh slavery and reconstruction period into a cartoon with splatter violence uh you know, no wonder Spike Lee was offended by this movie. When you do a movie where we can talk about what Bruce Lee was like as a real person, but he mm -hmm. wasn't completely the villain, like the bad guy that portrayed him these previous things. He matured, he grew, he became a better person. Um, 
I take great issue with that portrayal of him, which portrays him like a jerk where he has the fight with uh, Brad Pitt's character. And you're going, this is offensive. You don't need to, uh, what's more, it was incredibly racist. You don't need to, you could have put your own stand in mm -hmm. in there. You didn't have to do that to the guy. You didn't have to slander him like that. And my biggest problem with Tarantino is you train. You train, I understand, and uh, you trained at least in, in Taekwondo. I don't know whether you train now. Are you trained now? Or I no? trained Taekwondo as a kid, five and a half years, up to brown stripe belt, um, yeah. and was towards the end of it, uh, I was 14 years old in an adult red and black belt class because it was too yeah. big for the, the kids. More recently, that was over, you know, that was almost 20 years ago. Um, more recently, I've been doing five years of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. And have you ever been in any actual fights? Uh, many yeah many okay real violence is not something to be enjoyed no. real violence and the thing is my t my sensei again would say you've got to realize the incredible forces that you can whip when i was in my prime whack back when i had hair you know it was thin um we had he had a little device that could time you in terms of hitting a makiwara for those who don't know that's a post that you can either bolt to the floor or you can dig in is traditional that you practice on. And I could punch within an eighth of a second, boom, <laughs> and I'm there. And I was like one of the least accomplished guys in the dojo, but that means I can hit your face in an eighth of a second. Mm -hmm. And by the same token, I could put my fist through two panels of pine board an inch thick. Well, to be fair, I can teach you how to do that in 10 minutes. I can teach anybody how to do that in 10 minutes. It's physics. But the thing is, you're not going to like my fist coming in your face. That is vi that is violence when, when it has to be used. Real violence is nasty. It's, it's not something to be enjoyed. It's not something to be reveled in. And having gone to war zones... I've seen enough death to last me a lifetime. So the thing is, I don't want to get into fights. I don't want to hurt somebody. I want to avoid fights. And that's the paradox of martial arts. As you are, and the joy of it, as you are learning how to defend yourself, you realize what really matters. And you go, yeah, this is why your karate, like <laughs> jujitsu and other guys go, you're a blowhard. I'm walking away. Mm -hmm. Because they know, <laughs> they know, I don't want to beat you up. I don't want to like hurt you. Like I, you find a way to de-escalate and decompress hopefully. And well, I've been trained in years, so maybe I would get into fights now because I got a temper. But <laughs> the thing is, I'd like to think that this is what it's supposed to do. That is, that is the riddle that you discover as you mature in your training. As you grow as a person, you discover, I don't have to. Once you learn the skills, you go, oh, I don't need to do this anymore, which is why I hate somebody like Tarantino, who I suspect has never been in a real fight in his mm -hmm. life or ever had somebody like, you know, when people would say to me, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you, I would say to them very calmly, and now I can pull it off better with a bald head, but I'd be saying, I'm not going to boast about killing you. I'm going to break your arm. Would you like to pick which one? Because, you know, I can break the arm you use regularly. <laughs> and that's very specific. It's also very scary to go, I'm going to break your arm. <laughs> it's like, shit. Yeah, the, spe the specificity uh, definitely hits it there. It's funny when you were talking about Bruce Lee, what came to my mind too, and the ethnic portion of it. One of the things, I don't know if it's uh, anachronistic, if it's a legend or if it's real, um, but they were, I I've heard many times that, he was getting in trouble for teaching white people about martial arts. It had that had that uh, taboo, whether real or fake, ever impacted your your learning of the martial arts? Me personally, yeah, um, yeah, or uh, any conversations you ever had with with people know, so or at your dojo? <laughs> well, you got to remember the thing is a lot of this is 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 so much because keep in mind. You, tra you trained in uh, Taekwondo. Taekwondo mm -hmm. was popularized by American veterans who came back from the Korean War to an extent. Uh, Morahai Washiba, if I remember correctly, did a demonstrate did demonstrations in the United States. Um, the real practitioners of the art had no racial sort of animus. They wanted other people to learn these mm -hmm. arts. You know, <clears throat> or, excuse me. Um, they wanted to share this stuff. You know, you can't study this stuff 
and really, um, well, maybe that's an overstatement, but let's say that if you have an open mind to learn a martial art, you're going to have hopefully an open mind on other things. My dojo was bizarre because Hoko Dojo was kind of like had the cast of like an old fashioned World War II movie where you had every ethnicity in it. <laughs> we had we had African guys. We had at one point a Filipino Catholic priest. We had wow. you know yeah we had uh, we had people from <laughs> we had and what you guys would call in California Indian, but we call an Aboriginal person. Mm -hmm. Great guy, Sensei Ted. We had uh, people. Polish. We had people who were French. We had people every possible, and uh, and it also jumped class lines as as well. You know, I was at the time a civil servant for the Ontario government. I left journalism. I was, I went from journalism to uh, working for the Ontario government for a bit, mm -hmm. then back to being poor and a journalist and writing books. Um, so there was that there were stockbrokers there was a there was a guy who was an aerospace engineer <laughs> there there was an elevator repairman <laughs> there were like people from all walks of life in this dojo really? and my teacher of course you know his name is was miguel palavicino he mm -hmm. was from originally from uruguay he spent many years in um I believe Buenos Aires, uh, in Argentina. And the thing is he got into it because he went down to the docks one day and he saw, um, Japanese merchant seamen just mixing around and, you know, like, like doing sparring and goofing around. I went, wow, this is cool. Nice. And so studies that, you know? So, I mean, I've never run into, I've never run into any kind of nonsense in that respect. And I've had the opportunity as well to interview some of the legends in terms of, of, um, in terms of martial arts, I, I put it away, but the thing is I could have shown you another spread, the Yoshinkan Aikido dojo mm -hmm. smack in the middle of downtown toronto i presume it still does but for years and years it would host an international exhibition and they would get aikido dojos from all over the world um they would get not just japan but they get people coming from you know australia they get people come from england and they'd come and it wasn't a competition they would just come to show their art and you take this in you're just going and to me um, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, uh, nationalist in sense of the art I'd be, I'd be going, this is cool. Like, this mm -hmm. is like nuclear physics. I, I watched a guy, you know, they're both in Hakamas and I watched this guy. I think they were both from Japan. And he comes playfully to pick the, to grab the pigtails of a young woman who's another like black Hakama advanced student. And mm -hmm. she does this maneuver. She goes, Whoop, and he, uh -oh. she flips him across the thing. <laughs> and you're just going, okay. Yeah, I, how does that it, not hurt her head? I, well, not only that, but <laughs> teach me that. You know, I watched, I watched, I forget the gentleman's name. I watched him do this live. Gozo Shioda did something similar that you can see on video where he had two big guys who were bookends and they went to push him like this. And the the sensei just root himself to the ground and they bounced off of him like a force field. It was like magic and going, okay, that's the level of key. That's way out of my league. <laughs> just going, you know, okay, can I learn that? <laughs> you know? So this is, this is an art. This, these are arts that are so useful as an international currency for bringing people together mm -hmm. from, you know, can you, I was thinking about in preparation for this interview. And the thing is in terms of your, your cultural background and one of the first things I had to figure out and learn when I was ducking into the history was in Shotokan karate, as your father, you know, probably could tell you is they lengthened their stances mm -hmm. over time because they were working on these long polished hardwood floors. Yeah. And at first you go, Oh, come on, really? And they go, nope, nope, that's true. And you think about the various terrains of Ethiopia. Can you imagine if you had at the time of, of the cultural exchanges where Japan was very interested in Ethiopia, like around the 1920s yeah. and 30s, if they had imported 
karate or something. That would have been would amazing. Have been wild. Yeah. Can you yeah. imagine what because the short stances, you can look back in the early um publications of Kichin Funakoshi and others, the stances are very short. Even their belts, the knot is not in the navel, it's on the side. And so their stances are very very short, like very short. Because they were used in Okinawa. They didn't get longer until mm -hmm. they adapted in Japan. So from a perspective of, say, the Ethiopian, the different terrains, wow. Like It would be <laughs> phenomenal. I've seen numbers as high as 70% of Africa's um, highlands or mountainous regions are, are in Ethiopia. And I've looked into what are the indigenous martial arts there. I've seen stick fighting before in one of the southern regions on Vice. I have seen... Um, in the in the north, people talking about a testa tradition or the headbutting exclusive martial art, yeah. and um, my uh, the bishop there's in a, the Ethiopian wait a minute, there's order, a headbutting martial headbutting art? only <laughs> martial art, not just headbutting, but headbutting only. Um, and then there's uh, my the bishop. He's the archbishop of the diocese of Southern California and Alaska and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Uh, I'm a deacon, so yeah. kind of close with him. He saw me training. Because I would come to church sometimes and have the uniform and switch out what, if I have another gig. And he would be like, you know, we used to do this when we were kids. And it's interesting, his was more similar to judo. And of course, they didn't have any uniform. But the various monastic students in between learning traditional gz, chanting and scriptures and patristics, they would uh, they called it tigil. And they would, their thing was just who can take the person down. So it would be like doing a hip toss or something and whoever wow. gets you to the ground. And they wouldn't do any ground fighting. But he said he himself, when he was like between 10 and 15, used to often participate in like hip tossing or other types of takedowns. What decade are we talking about here where they were doing this? He's about 60 years old. So I would say about uh, 40, 40 years ago, maybe 40 to 50 years ago. So probably right around the turn between Haile Selassie's um, regime falling to the, in the, dirt, the dead yeah. in the 70s, probably around that. Amazing. Then. But that actually is, we should talk more in the future because the, the, off the, off the podcast, because the thing is to me, that's fascinating. And also mm -hmm. it tells me that, um, there are some fascinating sort of interactions between Japan and, and Ethiopia, which you reminded me of recently yeah. in terms of at one point they had a proposed marriage, which never came off in terms of the prince and one of the princesses and it just didn't happen. Yeah. But the idea uh, not to speak for this Catholic priest, but the thing is, uh, at our dojo, but the word was that he went through a crisis of, of confidence for a while. It didn't shake his faith, but one of the main tenets, of course, uh, with Asian martial arts is mind and body is one. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, and that's very difficult to kind of wrap your head around if you're coming from a Catholic faith belief system that goes, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, <laughs> body and soul separate. And I I was curious to go, well, okay, how would the Orthodox, I don't know enough about the Orthodox Church yeah. to reconcile that. But I don't even think, I don't even think it would necessarily be a problem because you don't have to necessarily import all of the contextual Asian, you know, philosophy, religion, philosophy yeah. to do the art itself. You the soul go thing go, is, yeah. as a specific thing I could tell you in the teacher in the church, the soul kind of view in the Latin and the Greek fathers is a yeah. Platonic and Neoplatonic influence. It's actually not innate to the Semitic conception of Christianity. And in the Semitic Christianity of Syria, so the Syriac speakers or the Aramaic speakers, and in Ethiopia, the Giz speakers, their view is the word nefesh, which is in Hebrew, it's the same in Syriac and Giz, it's nefs. Um, and people still use it today in Amharic, is um, it's like that which animates your body. So it's inherent. Yeah. There's no separation there. It's, wow. you know, it, it, it's, it's used interchangeably as soul or life or life breath. So but that's, that's fascinating because that ties in perfectly with the idea of breathing in terms of mm -hmm. key, like, holy crap. So you got a, you, we, you have had a marvelous pairing where you could go, here you go, <laughs> like, and take this, <laughs> take this, you know, like, yeah. and, and what's more, you have a warrior tradition Absolutely. in history within, so they would have, they could have, 
they probably will have gotten this and gone, hell yeah, we want some of this. <laughs> like, cool. yeah. teach, teach us how to do roundhouse kicks in Washington. <laughs> like, I, fantastic. yeah, I, if, if uh, the education minister is listening out there, the former uh, uh, professor <clears throat> who had a great New York Times article years ago, I would, I would love to take over the, <laughs> uh, have some influence in his ear on the martial arts portion of uh, or whatever the Ministry of Education is uh, doing today's and I want to shift to Ethiopia but before we get there I wanted to get your your take on two kind of more popular more recent um specifically karate based things that I have watched and enjoyed did you ever have any opinions on the original karate kid films and or have you seen the cobra kai on Netflix which they seem to be milking it's in its fifth season I've only seen 3 seasons of it um I never watched Cobra Kai because the thing is to me, it just, the whole premise was kind of sad. Mm -hmm. It was invented for the sake of, you know, let's drag these guys yeah. who haven't done much out of like, and the troll, if, if you go back to be fair, like that sounds like a diss and it's kind of unfair. But the thing is I have no interest in, mm -hmm. in that kind of thing. And Ralph Macchio, um, people forget he did other roles, yeah. you know, he could have possibly had a better career. You know, Hillary Swank went on to do other things besides Absolutely. the next karate kid. And for me, the I karate think was Electra too, if I'm not mistaken. No, the Marvel. no, that was, uh, that was, uh, uh, that was Ben Affleck's ex-wife. Um, okay. what's her name? Gardner. Um, yeah, Jennifer Gardner. Um, but they look as similar. Mm -hmm. So you're so basically you're saying brunette women all look alike to you. Uh, <laughs> you caught me. You caught you me caught in my me. racism. <laughs> no, the the first the first three f movies were very good because the thing is they had something to say. They had something to say in terms of, um, and the thing is, Pat Morita is fully fluent in English. Like they they make him do a pigeon English sort of deal. The guy is like fully fluent in in. He's Japanese American, mm -hmm. but he's fully fluent in English. Yeah. But the thing is, the movie had something to say in terms of tournament beat conduct, in terms of the, the type of shit that is probably still going on where you put somebody in a you you might have a purple belt, but you move them down to green belt because then you got a you got a ringer who can yeah. win that category. It's all about trophies. And we were talking it's before the interview. Yeah, we were we were talking before the interview about how I did not get into martial arts to win trophies. Mm -hmm. I, I trained for all of five minutes as a kid in judo, disliked it intensely because kids would like, like do a free for all bullying session before the class. It never made sense to me mm -hmm. in terms of judo because you've got this gi and I'm going, yes, but not everybody's walking around with this big gi. Yeah. gi. <laughs> and no. Whereas karate, okay, I can kick and punch this guy and he can be wearing anything. I don't give a no. shit. Um, but the whole idea of of maturing spiritually and psychologically through it was also the message of the movie in terms of going, oh, this is helping you grow. And this yes. is forget the tournament. But as I said to you before we started this, you know, I watched a kid get pulled out of a tournament on a goddamn ambulatory stretcher. And you're going, this is not good no. you know maybe when done well but judging can be corrupted blah 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 so the first three movies especially the third one um was very interesting because it was all about psychological manipulation and mm -hmm. the movie f fails in its third act because then it becomes a standard thing but up until that point you're watching again a portrait of everything bad about these guys who go off and start dojos and then abuse their students and you know we had we had incidents even in toronto where you'd hear of creeps like hitting on women mm -hmm. and disrespecting them in the dojo. they were incredibly sexist today hopefully it's a better climate where people were they would try to beat up women who tried to join their dojos yeah. and you're looking and go our dojo you know, I'm, I'm overselling it, but there are people who know who were there. Like they would be mortified if, uh, if somebody was, was hurt in our dojo. We actually had a joke about it because guys would go away on vacation, break their legs in skiing or something, <laughs> hurt themselves, <laughs> something not in martial arts, yeah, yeah. but not in the martial arts. Yeah. We only had like two injuries. I can ever think of that I ever, and I was witness to them both where one guy accidentally drove his fist down mm -hmm. and somebody was bringing their 
leg up and they collided and it drove in his knuckle so that it was oh. now flat <laughs> and unfortunately it was the third knuckle which is not the one we use um and there was another where a guy uh in a brown belt level uh kicked you know brown belts are notorious for not having full control yet mm -hmm. and he kicked a young woman who's now a very pop very successful uh comedian out in your neck of the woods uh -huh. um and she sure went eep and sort of crumpled and this person was like a little sister to us all i was like mm -hmm. bob what'd you do like <laughs> they're just you know, and which is the atmosphere you should have in a dojo where safety is your primary concern yeah. you know one sundomi you come you know this close and no closer you want to get a whisper close to that kind of thing so the to circle back to the main point i'm not a fan normally of such movies because mm -hmm. or any martial arts film because quite often you see there's no reinforce there's oh yeah they do the arts but there's no reinforcement of of what should be the underlying message of what you're training in the first place i mean mm -hmm. the closest you know you and i both know that the closest we've seen to what is a realistic fight is the early jason bourne films oh those are my favorite, yeah yeah where, yeah where you're going now the trouble is is that anybody who's ever been in a fight knows the whole point of the fight is to end it very quickly if the mm -hmm. fight is going on and on you are failing <laughs> so yeah. the thing is, you want to take the person out fast the jason bourne films had to be long because otherwise oh what's the point you know it's choreographed but at least it was choreography where it go, where it's going no i'm not doing something pretty and doing style is it no i'm going to hit you with a book as a matter of fact i'm going to use the book and hit you through the book and beat the hell out of you with any instrument that you have it's like yeah that's about as realistic as we can get for the moment it wasn't like this matrix mm -hmm. you know, yeah, the pauses and everything yeah, yeah you know so I'm, well, I'm not a big fan of those depictions. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting you mentioned the abuse thing. Actually, my my dojo was very fantastic, very safe, very clean. Yeah. Uh, that protects people very much. But the dynamic of like you know the people who work in the checkout, who are very often women and may or may not train, and then you know men interacting with them of all walks of life as you described you could just yeah. imagine and they kind of sent a, a kind of a polite reminder <laughs> to keep it very professional uh there which lets me know you know i i'm sure some comments got there but when you talk about abuse i think of actually um this is guy riley stearns he's a i think he's a brown or a black belt in in jujitsu but he made a karate movie the art of self-defense a few years ago and i've actually yeah. trained at his dojo before that one is the much darker side of abuse and you know almost you know almost satirically but it's also you know like sadistic so uh depend on people's stomach for that i wonder if you had a, a chance to to see that one no, no, no okay. is is it because he's a jerk or he's or he's actually documenting how other people are jerks? <laughs> the main guy, I don't I don't know much about him other than that he made that and uh, I had uh, trained at his place once. But in the in the show, it's like uh, in the movie rather, it's um, this the it's like a younger kid. I'm forgetting his name. His name's like Jesse Walker or something. Let me see the art of self defense, and um, he. Uh, he is like very uh, timid. Jesse Eisenberg, that's his name. Yeah. Uh, he, oh, I think. Oh, I've heard the movie. Heard of it. Yeah. I haven't seen it. No, and, sorry. And his his dojo, his instructor, his sensei is like just super, like you know, douchey, and uh, is kind of like the the kind of archetype of um, of the villain in in the Karate Kid as well. At, at, older you know this kind of just crushed the enemy and uh, but but like like you said it's it's a it's a reminder anyway that that people like that exist people who are just uh giving you belts and trophies to make money off of you so that you you know stay a paying client but there are also traditional places that that have a greater philosophy well i've seen this uh, i mean we're both on twitter and i've seen this as well because i follow um she'll never see this but i'll compliment her anyway i follow mm -hmm. a woman called anna maltese mm -hmm. uh who actually was i think for something like 10 years um, an animator for the Simpsons. And this woman is a qualified archer. She's a brilliant archer. Wow. Uh, she's done uh, videos of herself where she's also uh, practicing. I, I 
don't quote me on this. I it might be Kung Fu, but mm -hmm. obviously a skilled martial artist in Kung Fu. And the thing is, every so often you'll see idiots of men who will make some kind of stupid sexist remark. And the thing is, I pity the guy who is stupid enough to think, well, women can't do martial arts. And you're going, now I came, I started my working career in the early 80s, and I was fortunate enough to work with women, have bosses, and it doesn't make me more noble. It just means I had the experience of mm -hmm. I had good female bosses, I had bad female bosses, a couple of them. But you interacted with women as people. And in the same way, I would go to the dojo, and you know, I would be a white belt, and there was a young woman, I believe she was like worked in the financial industry, and she'd be scoring the hell out of me during the <laughs> thing, and she would laugh. She would giggle. She'd like get in and go. <laughs> and the thing is, you couldn't feel angry because it mm -hmm. wasn't, she wasn't laughing at you. It was just the sheer joy yeah. of doing that. And we had some women who, who this, this particular woman went on to become one of the most um, well-known instructors of Iaido at the uh, Yoshinkan Dojo, which also had a brilliant Iaido instructor, which for those who don't know, Iaido is the art of drawing the sword. Mm -hmm. So this woman is like, again, one of these people who is a walking bomb. And so pity the fool who still brings these sexist notions of women can't do this. I know women who could take you apart like a damn tinker toy <laughs> and they might be they may be like five feet tall like you you go in with that kind of arrogance at your own risk own, if you're yeah. that stupid to do that because there are women who you know it's the same thing if you look at ethiopian history Mm -hmm. The women patriots, if I'm pronouncing the word properly, Arbanoch. Yeah, uh, Arbanoch. I don't know. I don't know if there's a female version of that uh, in, in terms of Not the word. Or, no, so, Arba, female Arbanoch were badasses. Would be the closest. Yeah, but they're badasses. Like these are badasses. Like who could take on Italian soldiers? Go. There's mm -hmm. a there's a story in my book Prevail where this woman, this one guy, he doesn't want to carry the flag. He gets shot, and she turns around, takes the flag, and says, "Good, you're dead. Now I'm going out." <laughs> she's just going. He's <laughs> just going. Okay, this is the woman you want leading the unit. <laughs> like never mind <laughs> whether it's men, women. You want her, you know. So it it extends to it extends to martial arts as well in terms of proper respect due to the person not the gender <laughs> so yeah. that has to be said if we're going to talk about this stuff you have to you know you have to absolutely treat the the individual skill with respect and don't yeah. underestimate people like that i mean that's a basic sort of thing but that's a great transition actually into ethiopia i first came across i think your medium article how Western mm -hmm. media is failing Ethiopia back in the summer of 2020. That's how you got on my radar. But when I had actually mentioned your name, my mother had prevail already and had had read it. So it was already in our our household. But I'm wondering because that's when I got into you. But you you've been in this for a while, even though you've kept your fighting spirit against digital way. Yani, you had some knowledge of Ethiopia before that. How how did you kind of first hear about? Uh, Ethiopia. I hope it wasn't just the famine stuff. Oh God, no. Well, the thing is, I, I, I probably, um, I was probably. Keep in mind, I'm, a, I'm, a, I was born in the '60s. So the thing mm -hmm. is, we were the generation. We were the first generation which were stupid enough to be playing Christmas, and it was pointed out, and I knew this, and we didn't care because it was a catchy tune that. Uh, yeah, we think they know it's a, it's not their Christmas, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're Orthodox B, <laughs> they know it's Christmas dumbasses, <laughs> and, um, and they just listen to the, and year after year, they keep reissuing it with different lineups and you so of course I was, that was kind of on the radar, mm -hmm. um, even in my teen, it, I would have been in my teens, I think when the Derg yeah. were slaughtering people. Um, and I took great, and yeah, I took a great offense to that because they were like the African Khmer Rouge, but I didn't have a, a huge knowledge of Ethiopian culture. Even, even when I did prevail, 
uh, I was working on a, under a misassumption because I thought you guys all know your history. You don't mm -hmm. need this book. So the book was actually designed really for those who like history, but also primarily a target audience of African Americans. And then I discovered, wow. okay. yeah. And then I discovered the African Americans by and large there. Yeah. There's a few, but by and large, they don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. You know, it was for you guys and you guys all took to it. And my first revelation to who cared about this book was I came down ironically enough I came down to Silver Spring Maryland yeah <laughs> during during a winter storm uh and you guys had like this little bit of frost and you all panicked and Washington went oh my god there's snow there's snow and I'm a Canadian I'm going yeah <laughs> this is kind of sad and so I got to walk around and it was slipped on my ass and because you guys had no salt no, or, yeah. or, sand, or, or sand. So I go in and people came out. It was a really good turnout for a, for a February. Is that when Patriot's Day is? I always mix it up. It's either Edward or Patriot's Day in February. I don't uh, recall, yeah. Yeah. And we had a great turnout and I'm standing there and I am the only white person in the community hall mm -hmm. and I'm going, I'm dead what the hell am I doing <laughs> going to be lecturing these people about their own history? And they couldn't have been nicer. My money was no good. They were buying mm -hmm. me drinks, buying me meals. People were so kind to me. I had teenagers walking up to me. I'd never seen this before because <clears throat> digital cameras on cell phones weren't that great then. So they would have me sign autograph burn notes. It was the wildest thing. And that was the first impression of, oh, I'm onto something with this yeah. book. And the other thing too was when I had gone in um, 2013 to do the research on the country, I had gone there and I went to, to Harar as one of my first stops out of- My grandmother's city. Yeah. And of course I couldn't visit inside the mosques, but I'm looking around going, wow, this is wild. Mm -hmm. And there was a camera crew for camera pics. I didn't realize at the time, uh, cause they didn't tell me, um, it was actually done for Chinese, uh, television for Ch CCTV. And later, I guess they sold it to others. Had I known it was going to be done for CCTV, I probably wouldn't have done it because <laughs> I don't like communist propaganda. Uh. Um, but the thing is they were doing a documentary on Haile Selassie mm -hmm. and they didn't, they were doing it right at what was the Rasmaconan statue before yeah. it was vandalized and taken down. And. I there said, are hey, what? photos of Haile Selassie and Mao out there, by the way. Yeah. They, but they were doing the thing and they didn't know their way into the Casbah to get to his house. Mm -hmm. And I did. So I led them. And along the way, we're chatting. And they said, you should be in this documentary. I said, well, I'm not an authority. I don't have a degree. Yeah. I'm not a historian. I am writing a book on this. And they said, oh, and suddenly I'm a figure in the documentary. And wow. I would, for a couple of years, at one point, I, wa I was eating a meal at an Ethiopian restaurant. My first tip off of what I was coming becoming mm -hmm. was I'm going to the John and some guy goes, <laughs> I'm going, <laughs> and I'm going, do I know this guy? And, uh, and you know, like, who is this? You were in that documentary. You were in that documentary. I'm going, which? And then I figured out. And then when the column, there were two columns that put me on the map, so to speak. One was the one that you're referring to. The other mm -hmm. was... I was so pissed off because we had massacres of Amhara going through the summer of 2020. Yes. No one cared. And so I wrote, if I made a grammatical mistake in the headline, which was dumb, but um, it said, it basically should have said, Ethiopians come together as one people. And overnight, boom, like 20,000 plus people read this column. They're going, holy wow. crap. Like, and I'm going, and then when I wrote the Western column, Somebody on Twitter goes, hey, Jeff, you're on television. And he sends me a screenshot of his living room where he's taken a photo of my face on a TV screen. I'm going, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> like, it was just bizarre. And from there, it was just, yeah, it was, <clears throat> it was, I was in it. So I heard you use the word Amhara, and it's very interesting. I'll tell you. Um, when I was growing up as a kid, I didn't really even understand what that was until well into my adulthood. When you were writing Prevail, um, a lot of times the everything surrounding the ethnic federalism, I usually call it 
pseudo-linguistic ethnic federalism that was established by TPLF basically from 1991 to the present, although they've kind of been out of power since 2018, and that's what the whole yeah. war is about. What, what, what sort of awareness of <laughs> ethnicities within Ethiopia, was that on your radar at all, or was it not even like something it, that you could think of? Like, they're just Ethiopians. If, if I don't know something, I admit I don't know it. I mean, mm -hmm. that, is the, that is the smart policy to do. If you don't know something, admit you don't know it. And the thing yeah. is, at the time that I wrote Prevail, I had inklings of this because, of course, I had to because there are only two real references in the book to ethnicity. One mm -hmm. is to, I believe, I'm going by memory, I could pull it out, but the thing is, one is to the Oromo because mm -hmm. the Oromo um, did not really help with the liberation. They did not help with... Uh, well, no, that's not fair because Chikama Kello, one of the greatest patriots of all, was of Romo descent. But there are Romo sections which were not helping the Ethiopian forces while they were fighting the first invasion in 35-36. Haile Selassie refers to this. At the time, the term gala was not as pejorative as it later became. So I had to reference that. Mm -hmm. I think there's a reference at one point to the Afars um, in the book. But... The target audience that I had in mind when I wrote the book was, again, African-American and Western audience. It was for a Western audience. So the thing is, getting into the complexities to me of ethnicity for that book was irrelevant. It would have gone over the heads of many people. Now, there are people today, and I find this, I see where they're going, but I find it mildly offensive where they point out that um, some of the traitors who sided with the e Italians were of Tigrayan descent. Yeah. And the thing is, to me, this is offensive and a non-starter because what are you doing with this? Mm -hmm. There were traitors because they were traitors. There weren't traitors because of their ethnicity. That's racism. <laughs> it's bigotry, you know? Yeah. And, and they want to draw a link between, and yes, it's true. Some of the modern TPLF guys, excuse me, are descendants of those traitors. So what? You know, where are you going to go with that? You want to smear an entire ethnicity? Mm -hmm. um, contrary to my critics who would like to portray me and have tried to portray me as somehow against the Tigrayan people, I'm not. And um, my message, and as a matter of fact, the whole point of what I'm working on now is, and I can prove it, is that the different peoples of the country worked as collaboratively. Mm -hmm as they work competitively against each other to form the nation. I'm busy at the moment tunneling my way through texts to figure out Bidemarium after mm -hmm. the successor to the Emperor Zura Yaakov. And I read Bidemarium's, you know, fighting against the Adol, if I'm pronouncing it properly, is Sultanate there. And he parks his mobile, you know, uh, court in Garagi territory. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, what does that tell you? Now, I'll do read more, so don't take this as my fixed opinion. But the thing is, he's, he's there for a while, which means either A, he pacified it already, or B, they were happy to let him be there and didn't mm -hmm. have a problem. So the thing is that the symbiosis in terms of the relationship, as a matter of fact, when he was going against, um, I will probably mispronounce the name of this, so I apologize. But then I think the people might not exist anymore as a people. But he was fighting against a rebellious sort of individualistic pastoralist and people called the Doeba or Doba. And the Afar guys went, hey, we'll help you with this. And he <laughs> brought down because they didn't want the army camping out and taking all their water. And so the guy was always loyal to his court goes, yeah, we'll help you with this. And he called on units to come from Tigray and come from Wallo. Uh, well, not Wallo, but um, parts of Amhara. Mm -hmm. And so you had collaborative forces all joining together as a national entity, <laughs> you know, and that's, we're talking the 1400s. Yes. So when somebody is, tries to sell me this bullshit and it is bullshit that, oh my gosh, there's been a Tigrayan Amharic dominance in terms through the centuries. 
<laughs> like, how often do we have to say it? And I've said this multiple times. Aroma was spoke. Afan Aroma was spoken at the court in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. Haile Selassie's mother had Aromo roots. Menlik is thought to have had Garagi ancestry in part. You can go through the ages and go, who was, you know, the flag and the national language was set by a Tigrayan emperor, <laughs> Johannes the <IV>. Fourth. <laughs> Stop with the BS that it was dominated by one single people. The fact that you didn't hear about Amhara till you were older speaks to the integration culturally of the different peoples. Because, you know, <laughs> that's yeah, the and way I'm you biased were in that fashion because both of my parents grew up in Addis Ababa. Yeah. And then I had uh, two of my dad's parents grew up in Diredawa and in Harar. So you have three kind of cosmopolitan areas. So yeah. it kind of became super cosmopolitan. Me being born and raised in LA, it really was far from from their mind. The sort and, of and to be fair, to be fair, okay, uh, you know, I lived in London for something like six years. London is not England, you mm -hmm. know. I live in Toronto. Toronto is not Canada. You mm -hmm. went to Winnipeg. Yeah. Like if you come up to Toronto, you'll see, you'll hear every possible language. You'll see every possible shade. You go up to Winnipeg and my God, it's white. Yeah. <laughs> it's so <laughs> blindingly pale and white. It's like, and I didn't even realize that till I left the city. I went, oh, people come in different colors and shades. <laughs> like, great. <laughs> you know, like by comparison. Um, yeah. It, it, you notice it. And, um, I, I mention this because you you must have been taken aback I with your newer found fame and in the struggle uh, online the the various uh, digital battles I I saw uh, one of your articles on your Substack is about the war crime trial of Alex DeWall yeah. I had just watched an episode <laughs> of his appearance on the Majority Report by Sam Sater that Michael Brooks uh, of of late fame used to be a part of as well and i had been aware of, of their program for a few years even before i found uh your work or maybe around the same time and you you list him with a, a bunch of the other people i didn't know all of the people that you listed but uh martin plowd and uh, rashid abdi and william davison i saw as well some of whom you know maybe buffoons some of whom maybe the spooks that sit at the door uh you know i don't entirely know what's going on there but one of the things that was frustrating me and making me want to grab the tv and, and why i emailed sam sater i don't know if he'll ever get my <laughs> message because he said he says he's open-minded and wants to have other people on to, to discuss that if, if it's the case if it's true um you know i i hope to at least you know mention something like he asked him point blank uh, uh alex de he asked alex de what the ethnicity of abi ahmed was and instead he gives these roundabout kind of uh, stories uh like yeah. about the home yeah, director, he never answers. Uh, Teddy's uncle. He never answers yeah. it. Yeah, he and, never answers it. And, and the he, thing is, yeah, and the, and the thing is, I mean, let's back up a bit. I mean, because yeah. these guys come in, come in different categories. And I'm guilty of the same thing where um, I know what DeWall is doing. The thing is, he hears a question, and but he's intent on getting his message across. So, mm -hmm. and I used to do. I I am guilty of doing that sometimes too. I I talk about what I want to talk about instead of what yeah. what's being asked for a question. But I mean, you mentioned several names there. Yes. I mean, and they fall into different categories. Um, Martin Plout certainly is not a buffoon. The tragedy mm -hmm. of Martin Plout is I've met Martin Plout. As a matter of fact, I was trying to do a documentary based on Prevail. Um, it's got held up because we're still trying to get. Um, more um photos and certain footage so it stalled into the ground and it's a tragedy because one of the main witnesses Imre Zelke passed away I would have liked to have finished it before he he died um but Martin Plot was interviewed for that I've met mm -hmm. Martin Plot wow. um this is a guy who you know was a journalist but stood against apartheid this is a guy who at one point was one of the biggest proponents of helping african veterans of the world wars get their proper due because they had been ignored by everybody else you know there's wow. monuments that you can find in terms of like and where were the african where was those for the africans so he was a good guy once upon a time I don't know what happened to him. And uh, that's what I was going to ask you. Is it yeah. ignorance or malevolence with these characters? I well, the thing that. is, psychoanalyzing Martin is not going to get anywhere. Martin mm -hmm. and I ignored each other for quite a time. And then when I knocked Jen Nyson's 
you know, ridiculous geography where Nison wants to like rewrite the the rules and the borders of Wakayat. And, you know, and he brings in all these European maps. At one point he brought in a map of the Italians during the during the occupation, occupation. period. Ridiculous. And I thought to my, yeah, and I thought to myself, gee, shall we like redraw the lines of France during the, of Vichy? <laughs> you yeah. know, going to that. But the thing is when I went after that, Martin took a shot at me and I know rather than make it vitriolic, my sort of appeal to Martin is what happened to you, man? Like you used to be one of the good guys. Like the thing is there are people we know in common and I don't want to attack Martin on those grounds, even though he has been extremely nasty to other people. Now contrast that with people like Rashid Abdi, who I was on good terms with when Rashid Abdi started to say the most nasty hateful things like on the lot on the same ground as say Mukesh Kapila of uh, against Amhara. It was like, okay, the gloves have to come off with you. You've been like an irritant, but now I'm going after you because you were a hate monger. And the guy was working for Sahan research, Matt Bryden's outfit. And then he went on, as I understand it, working for international crisis group. Then you get the category of William Davison, or mm -hmm. as I like to refer to him, fungus, um, <laughs> as fungus on Ethiopian affairs. This is a guy who was once a reporter for Bloomberg. There are various sinister rumors about him, which I will not repeat um, because I'm still trying to check them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he got booed out of Ethiopia. He comes back after the political sea changes. He comes back for crisis group, gets booed out again. While he was working for crisis group, and I didn't know this when I had dealings, with, brief dealings with him, um, he was running his little sideshow of Ethiopian insight. Now, it is an incredible conflict of interest to be presenting yourself as a neutral observer of Ethiopian affairs and commenting on the unfairs on the affairs and at the same time you purport to run a news site mm -hmm. that's reporting on those affairs that's not how journalism is done that's not how it should be done at the same time i have him dead to rights with evidence of him bullying uh analysts especially female analysts uh and i've I've got the evidence of him just going on rant uh, and at least on one occasion is just a rant where he just goes after everybody inside, including people on his own side. He has impulse control issues. Uh, he made himself such a pest, especially to female pe personnel that they complained about him to the human rights uh, division of ICC of International Crisis Group. This guy is a problem. And then he can't stay away. He organized what I call the Fungus Club, mm -hmm. where he's got weasels like Patrick White, another guy who defended the use of child soldiers, and sadly a Canadian based in Montreal. Jason Mosley, who is one of the editors of, I believe, the Journal of these East African Studies of Oxford University, you know, who backs the TBLF line. He's got other idiots in this thing. Even when you have a country of 110 million telling you, get the hell out of our business, these guys won't quit. You know, they are the neo-colonialists. And so they come in different shades and sizes. DeWall is the most dangerous. DeWall Why? by far is the most dangerous because DeWall over time has insinuated himself to the point where he can write a column and get it published by the London uh, uh, Times Literary. Uh, he can get published in The Guardian. He can get published by the Times Literary Supplement. The he Journal of published, Prestige. Yeah, he can get published for in foreign affairs. And he's taken seriously. And what people forget is this guy was people who know better have called him out and said, this is how this guy said destructive comments about Sudan and didn't know what he was talking about and caused trouble. This is a guy who said stupid things about Rwanda and even suggested, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, even suggested that we step aside, that all of us in the West step aside as a massacre might get perpetrated in a refugee camp. That's on the record. He put that in print in the 90s. This is why I consider him the typhoid Mary of Africa. 
Mm -hmm. He goes from African country to African country. And if he's wrong, he goes, oh, gosh, I was flawed in my judgment, which he did. For, and everybody pat him on the back and said, oh, how honest of you to do this. And then went on to do the same thing in another country. He has to be, his influence has to be stopped. It has to be stopped. People have to know who this guy is and what a danger he is to the sovereignty of other African countries. They don't need him. They shouldn't have him commenting. And he goes around from country to country, just causing just, just so much damage to the process. And, and that's what, when I see all these characters and him, they have these kind of subtle brilliant ways and i say subtle and brilliant because someone like sam Sater in the majority report like they're not going to catch on to it he said he visited ethiopia 25 years ago and saw some poverty but other than that he didn't know a ton about it he knew there was some sort of conflict between ethiopia and eritrea but this didn't know Sater. the intricacies this is this, Sater. yeah he didn't know some of the intricacies of which groups it was like the fact and and this is where like the wall is like explaining <laughs> TPLF and President Isaiah Saforki and, and the, the conflict between them. But there are a lot of these nuances are lost. And that's why I had asked you if it's okay if you don't want to psychoanalyze when I'm asking about malevolence or ignorance. If if it's not that, is it helpful to think what possible incentives could they have? Is it like, I mean, he's an academic and there's this idea of you publish or perish and whether you're what you're doing is the ultimate truth or not is less relevant than the fact that you are just staying relevant and publishing. Is it that type of thing or uh, is, is it not helpful at all to even discuss the incentives of these various people? Because it's very widespread. And as you said, all of the major sort of news organization uh, places of prestige. One of the things, crazy things he said is that nobody had no journalist has been there since like, I think he said mid uh, 2021. I think you've made a trip and I think other people have made trips as well. So. Well, not only that, but the thing is, I, I just see red and I'm ready to blow. I, I'm ready to spontaneously combust when I hear that kind of crap. Martin Plout to an extent has done the same thing saying, oh, journalists aren't allowed in. And what they forget or want to ignore is the fact that Ethiopia has its own journalists. That's right. You know, they're journalists there, you know. And every time they do this, I say, let's see now. Nitsan Laku of Balagero, Balagero TV, Daniel McConan of uh, Arts TV, Shafara Laku of ETV, and I could go on. I don't know the print reporters, but I could go on and on. So you're going to say that there is no journalism infrastructure in the country that's innate <laughs> of the people themselves, that belongs to the people themselves, where we have Ethiopian journalists. In terms of psychoanalyzing them, I can't even begin to guess, because the thing is, you start to wonder, and it, uh, let me go off on a bit of a tangent here because it's a dangerous phenomenon on both sides of the blade, on both sides of the conflict. We have a certain people, and I've commented on this before. I won't name names. We have a couple of people who are on our side, mm -hmm. and they are just as stupid and just as ignorant, and they say stupid, ignorant things sometimes, and they do that because they haven't done their damn homework or they get taken in by certain propagandists. We have one in particular who... You know, I won't say who it is, but the thing is, uh, no, both of them have been taken in by um, somebody busy selling certain OLF propagandist points. And so they get very negative towards what they call Amhara extremism. Yeah. Now, of course, there may be Amhara extremism. I'm not, I'm not negating that. But the point is, we don't stop calling um, the Yaz we didn't stop calling Yazidis Yazidi when they're persecuting them in Syria, in Iraq. We did not call, stop calling the Jews Jews, <laughs> you know, when they were slaughtering them before the Holocaust uh, and persecuting them then. We didn't stop calling them Kurds when Saddam was bombing them and gassing them. Um, the fact of the matter is, is a bloody fact that the Amhara are getting massacred again and again and again and again with numbing stultifying regularity in and, the Oromia region. Yeah, and the Oromia region again and again. Uh, it is a fact. It is. It cannot be in dispute. Um, so that has to be. But these two individuals are supposed to be on our side. Mm -hmm. And they actually drag us down. And where I'm going with this is, unless you are actually going to bust your ass to learn the history, you can't see it. But the thing is, at my feet, um, 
I don't know if I can do this. I want to adjust the camera. So you, at my feet are two high stacks of books of Ethiopian texts. You know, Beautiful. I'm within reach is right on here is here's Ethiopia borderlands by Pankhurst. Here's Pankhurst Ethiopians. Here is what I just got today. Uh, in from amazon you know this okay we can go on we can go here ethiopian itineraries we have mm. prester john of the indies volume two <laughs> prester john of the indies volume one uh. these are so new excuse me that i have to actually cut the pages nobody was actually doing this is let's see now this is some records of ethiopia that you can see here beautiful edition here is greenfields ethiopia here is ethiopia the unknown land <laughs> and the thing is you know here's more pankhurst here's um levine uh let's see now we can go even further we've got Ethiopia and the Red Sea by Mordecai Haber. Yeah. The point is starting to sink in, hopefully, by this time with anybody watching this. Do your damn homework. And even with that, I don't claim to be an expert. You know, I don't claim to be an expert on anything. I'm still learning. This is how I this is how I teach myself. I write a book and go, okay, I better go learn this. Now, who is so stupid as to go into a country? without bothering to do their homework. Well, Sean Williams, for one, he buggered off for three to what, however weeks he spent in Tigray, didn't even bother to research the damn history of the country, came back, put on Twitter, and was shopping around for experts to help him polish up the history the references in his article and he still got them wrong he was still you can go online go to the gq article he's still referring to highly selassie as selassie he says <laughs> he, you know doesn't that realize me up. yeah yeah you know they and i've i've seen other people who are educated um do that they yeah. don't know but they haven't bothered to check uh he says stupid things in his article like selassie sat out the second world war Really? So when he crossed over from Sudan into Ethiopia with the liberation forces, that was him sitting out the war, you idiot. Um, and this is a guy who gets published by GQ, you know, and we see this time and again, you know, you had Carol Anna, who only ignorance could have had this woman write an article where she claims that the first sign of uh, a real proof of ethnic cleansing is to grains showing an ID card where there's no sign of their ethnicity on the card. <laughs> <It's just going. laughs> One for those who are just tuning in, this was a policy, which I believe was promised at least in 2018, <laughs> you know, there was no secret about the fact everybody hated the cards with the, uh, the ethnicity listed on it. As a matter of fact, they used cards with Amharic ancestry listed on it to go and kill people in my cadre. Yeah. <laughs> so and I is, I yeah. And so to suggest that, oh my gosh, it's a limb, it's erasing them by taking the name off. That is what we're fighting, the ignorance. And I'm still learning. There are things I learn every day that are new about the country and culture. I, I want to be a perpetual student. I, and as I've said in other forums, there is no curiosity without humility. You must admit that you don't know. Yes. So I ask a lot of questions when, for people. When I was riding around with Jamal Countess, the guy lived there. The guy lived there for years, you know, and that's on top of like five, you know, at least five trips while reporting on the war. So I was going, what about this? What about that? What about, uh, how about this? Uh, can you tell me about that? You know, I tried to soak up like a sponge what he had to tell me. He was big brother. I was little brother in, in our collaborations and our working together. You know, why would I not take advantage of that to learn? Drives me crazy when these guys do this. So all of these actors who are perpetuating the propaganda and the lies are counting on the ignorance of, and I don't know this fellow Seder. I don't know whether he has good intentions or bad. If you say, he seemed oh, curious, I'll say he yeah, seemed curious. Yeah. 
But, you know, I'm not going to knock them because also I didn't listen to the show. But the thing is, if you're going to go by just, well, I went to the country 25 years ago. Journalists, journalism is, I was thinking about this today. Journalism is the only field where you can go into it with ignorance and nobody faults you for that. Nobody like hires a carpenter and says, well, is this is your first day of sawing? <laughs> <laughs> nobody says, nobody, you don't hire a dentist and go, well, you know, I think I'll just wing it. <laughs> but journalism yeah. is a field where you can get away with having next to no, you know, Samuel Gitachu has never been until I think he might have been taking some lessons recently, uh, was sent back to school to give. <laughs> he has never had formal education in journalism. Uh, I have, you know, I took two years of, he's a fellow Canadian though. We like to say on Twitter, <laughs> he's a, he's a, one of the esteemed division of idiots. And the thing is he used to one, he wrote a column, uh, backing the idea of Tedros Adenham being director general of the who he liked to get himself photographed with, uh, TPLF officials and have photos of that. And he portrayed himself as a neutral observer. I didn't know about the extent of this until later. And this mm -hmm. is a guy who claims that he has evidence of me uh, being in the employ of the government, which is hilarious. Uh, the Ethiopian government or the Canadian? Oh, the Ethiopian government. No, the Canadian government <laughs> wouldn't want to go near me. Um, but the very idea, like the Ethiopian government probably thinks of me as a tremendous pain in the ass. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> but the I, idea, yeah. you know, I, I, I've said, I've said on more than one occasion, Sam, welcome back to Canada, because as soon as you do, I will sue your ass for libel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if I can raise the money on GoFundMe or whatever, I would. Because he right. outright libeled me on, on Twitter and said, he's a government, he's a government operative. And I'm going, really? Okay, well, <laughs> you come home, and we'll talk <laughs> in court. Yeah, I I've noticed that you you you're not afraid to give your own opinion, but like you said, you're not putting yourself out there as an expert. But based off of the like, obviously the the depth of the personal individual research that an independent research that you're doing, I've had a lot of non Ethiopian Americans who I maybe would like you to talk to and uh, in my audience who'd ask me like, well, then how can I get a discernment mechanism? How do I tell what is, you know, authentic versus what is inauthentic when all of the all of these different voices are out there. So I'm wondering if one you could speak to, um, you know, why you're able to still like, uh, emphasize or center Ethiopian voices? Like is that innate to you or is that something, you know, you learned somewhere, uh, you know, in school or, uh, and then adding to that, like um, how would you recommend people sift through any sort of news service about Ethiopia? And perhaps it could be instructive about affairs elsewhere in the world as well. Um, it's a very, well, that's a tall order. It's a very interesting question because the thing is I recently did four lectures for the School of Pan-African Thought um, based in London, a small institution, but which does really cool stuff. And the guy who is the director of the school who is monitoring the session just said, I'm shell-shocked because I did a presentation which was <laughs> walked him through. And these were not just Ethiopians who had dialed in, you know, for the Zoom sessions. This were other Africans. And even they weren't aware of what's going on. And I had walked them through going, this is what the mainstream media has Says. depicted the fight. This is what Human Rights Watch and how Amnesty International misuse photos and screw around with the stuff and mislead people in terms of what's really going on. And, oh, by the way, here's what WFP. I mean, here, you know, it's not just me here. Here's a book. You know, I just wrote an article on this recently. At the center of the world yeah, in Ethiopia. Yeah, and this guy's book, this is a gentleman, uh, Mr. Omamo, as uh, Steve Omamo is a Kenyan. You know, he was uh, he was the representative and country director for WFP in Ethiopia. He says flat out there was no famine. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, excuse me, he says there was rampant, you know, high level racism in the upper echelons of WFP during the time, you know, he, he, he's a person who, you know, you can go through the book. It's a nice little read, not just me saying this, this is a guy who was there saying it. Um, but the problem is, is that uh, all the doors of the media are closed and in the West, 
we are trained to think, oh, CNN, NBC News, CBS News, how could they all possibly be, be wrong? wrong? How could they all like, and Tom Gardner has done the same thing and, and others with disingenuous tweets trying to portray us as conspiracy theorists. And they know it's bullshit. And even Tom Gardner, who went out of his way to try to smear Ann Fitzgerald through his letter, now just wrote an article where he said, oh, yeah, here's my source who says that there was forced conscription. So you've just gone back on what you actually went out of the, your way to smear an academic about. Um, you asked about sort of my, how I ended up doing this. I've told the story before, but bears repeating. I would have stayed on the sidelines, mm -hmm. probably. I would have ignored it. I didn't need this business. Um, I was interested in not picking a side, but having everybody hopefully come together. Yeah. And the TPLF made a point. Uh, you pronounce it Wayani? Sorry. Way, yeah, Wayani. Wayani means rebellion, and I'm yeah, and yeah, the Wa yeah, the Wayani stupidly. <laughs> As I said on in another Zoom forum, they stupidly picked on me and went, as they did with others, and they thought they could browbeat me into condemning T. Gray genocide. They kept going, <laughs> why aren't you condemn condemning T. Gray genocide? Why aren't you speaking out about T. Gray genocide? In the early days, you can check. I wiped out my old tweets to stop them from, they were, they were trying to go after me, go after me, go after me, to the point where I just did scorched earth and wiped out all of my tweets. Mm-hmm. They thought I despaired. I had it. What I'd done is just gave them, took away their ammunition for a while. Um, but some people keep records of my stuff and you can find, I said, I don't know if I don't yeah. know something, I don't know. Which is fair. And, which is fair. And they stupidly kept at me. And then I went, okay, this is not just you lobbying. This is you bullying. So let's find out about you. <laughs> I talk into them because <laughs> I went, you're starting to piss me off. So I'm going to dig into your shit. And of course, what happened was um, the game was decided when what's his face went on regional T grade television and said, of course we attacked them. Mm -hmm. It was and, a Devon or a Getacho? Uh, no, it was uh, what's his face is now dead. Sorry, I, I blanked out his name. But the thing is, he went on. And you and I both trained in self-defense. You don't get to hit the other guy because you think the other guy's yeah. going to hit you. He's That's either George wind Bush up, Jr.'s yeah, preemptive yeah. strike. Yeah, you either wind up and see the fist in action or the guy who's hit you first. And so I'm going, game over. This is so, like, you attacked first. And then when I really started digging into it, I went, what the hell is going on here? And I have always been upfront about saying I didn't know too much about the TBLF or even mm -hmm. the coalition prior to that time. The Derg were easy to wrap your head around. They were Marxists. They were tortured people. They were psychos. That was easy. Parsing the coalition forces and in terms of the different ethnic armies, that is still to this day considerably harder. But all you have to really know is they came out on top. And then when you research them and discover, oh, you're a bunch of Nazi cultist oligarchs who literally think that you like in, you are descendant from a group of supermen who, by the way, have absolutely nothing to do with ancient Axum <laughs> because ancient Axumites were not Tigrayans. They were something else. <laughs> and we know this because you can look at a map and see how far ancient Axum <laughs> went further than Tigray into other areas of Ethiopia and how the empire extended into Yemen, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, so these morons busy walking around saying, and we invented ancient Egypt and we invented ancient <laughs> Babylonia. And we ancient, <laughs> and I'm going, yeah. well, that's a neat trip. Yeah. As though your empire only really got going around the time of Rome. <laughs> so are you really going to stand there and claim that you invented ancient Egypt's culture, which goes back at least to 3000 BCE? Really? <laughs> so, <laughs> right away, you're dealing with fanatics. And then you can go into the financial history. In terms of advice for non-Ethiopian Amer Americans or even Europeans, like, yeah, how can they read the news? How can they make sense of it if all of those people are lying? Like, how is, is there anywhere you would point them in terms of trustworthiness, whether it's individuals or organizations? 
the problem is is that i can't think of a single mainstream media outfit that has been consistently fair we saw this as well keep in mind i mean i even watched a movie about it recently um a bad hollywood movie in terms of w wmds i forget which paper it was it might have been the washington post um but the new york times can you still hear me yes yes yeah sorry i'm hearing the echo through your thing so i thought i might have screwed up something no, go ahead. um remember everybody thought wmds were real there was an entire chorus you know <laughs> and, and it became like al capone's like like you know bunker where they found nothing and only a single newspaper i forget which one it was but said this is nonsense this is complete nonsense and they stood alone against a an entire chorus of everybody saying wmds we had the same thing with the rwanda genocide where kagami you know has a lot to answer for and wasn't held accountable at the time and only now are we getting books out by michaela wrong and by another uh, canadian journalist uh, judy i have the book somewhere here in the stack um who wrote a wonderful book called, calling in praise of blood um that's now finally rewriting what's happened we don't want to we don't want to wait 20 30 years for the revisionism so uh, as even though it sounds self-serving, I would tell people to go read the articles of Ann Fitzgerald. I would tell them to read John Abink. I would tell them to read me. Um, I'm probably the most accessible one to pick up on. My early medium pieces were mostly written for Ethiopian diaspora, so they weren't written in the formal journalistic way. But even if they dip into, say, the mid-2021 articles, how are you going to how are you going to argue with the fact that i have from sources leaked un documents which even point to <coughs> excuse me un staff knowing and turning the other way to tplf committing war crimes and forced recruitment and incidents in terms of of you know how are you going to turn away from that i have sources who talked about the fact that they were assaulting uh staff un staff holding them virtually for ransom and not letting them go until the un came by and said can we have our guy back and they said yeah you can but you got to move them somewhere else to another region and they did they complied and if even if you want to believe that that my story is true that somehow i'm faking it how are you going to get around the fact that right here in black and white by steve omamo is the fact that he confronted a TPLF official in November 2021 and said, what are you guys doing busy assaulting and sexually assaulting UN staff in the Amhara region? And what are you doing to hold your people responsible? Lord That's Lord. him saying it, not me. And we didn't even learn about it until this book made prints, you know, and the UN still has not commented about that. The UN still has not disclosed the facts on that. So if you don't want to doubt me, here's Steve Amamo saying it, that there was no famine in Tigray. There never was. How are you going to discount the work of Ann Fitzgerald, who spoke to more than, I can't remember, at least more than 160, I believe, Tigrayan IDPs and got their accounts. And then later, Reuters, you know, actually confirmed that there was forced recruitment because it had 12 people they spoke to, 12 when she spoke to like more than 100. Tom Gardner is now confirming that he's got a single source that says there's forced recruitment. The truth is coming out. But the trouble is, yeah, you can't start with Reuters. You can't start with Guardian. You can't start with the BBC. You have to start with people like Anne. You got to start with people like me. You got to start with Rasmus Sondras, if I'm pronouncing his last name properly, based out of Chile from uh, Europe, um, who was a correspondent in Ethiopia. You have to start with the work of Jamal Countess, you know, the guy who did more to investigate and get to the truth of what was happening in my cadre than anybody else. 
And what I did in my cadre was follow completely in his footsteps. I'm the first person probably in English to do a video report on my cadre, but he was the one, he wasn't the first to get to my cadre, but he was the first to really do a thorough investigation of it for Getty images. So the trouble is tell your white American friends and European friends, start with us and then dig out from there. And we'll take questions and we can be challenged if somebody, you know, somebody wants to go have a go at our work. Really? Okay, fine. Because I got, you know, a stack of history books and I got a whole bunch of annotations of articles, you know, where I can point to here, 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 here. Good luck. You know, good luck knocking down what I've got. You really want to have a go at me? Like, well, you're going to have a hard time because I got the UN documents, you know? No, thank you for that. And I want to, I mean, it all affects me and impacts me. It's all, you know, these are human atrocities, but the my Kadra one really uh, sticks out to me. My uh, my maternal grandfather is from uh, that region. He had, uh, he was grew up in an area called Wagara in Northern Gondar, but he had land in Humara. And all of his people going back a long time are from that area. And actually part of my kind of work in this field is, and I could send it to you after, but I sure. translated a letter of his that was an opposition letter to TPLF and the then president Madlis Zinawi from November, 1991. And people usually share that letter. You may have come across it before in Amharic. So I took, I took uh, matters into my own hand because I kept seeing people sharing it in Amharic to translate it into English and then to share that widely as well. And some people have, have shared that that English translation of it had. Um, I read it originally like 10 years ago. I'm reading it again now during the war. One of the things that stuck out to me that I didn't back then was his uh, surprise of one of the regions, for example, being given to Beni Shangul Gumuz, who he said in print at the time that he had never even heard of them, uh, let alone that they have a region. And uh, that's a famed place where Emperor Johannes, uh, uh, you know, died to the dervishes, and where uh, Theodros, uh, Emperor Theodros, uh, grew up in the General Quara area, like the western yeah. parts of uh, what was Gondar, bordering the western parts of what was then uh, uh, Gujam. But I, I wanted to especially appreciate you for the work you've done in in uh, my Kadra for Humara and Walkait and and that area, which is still. Uh, ongoing, as far as I could tell from some of the AAA uh, Amhara Association and other people's comments on the Nairobi talks and the South Africa talks, uh, I don't, I haven't seen anything super official either on the Raya side of Northern Wallo, uh, Raya Zabo, or the uh, the Walkait issue. But status quo seems to uh, still be the same. And I, I neglected. I should have mentioned this too. I mean, the, to be fair, when I went to my cadre. We had the University of Gondor. We worked with the University of Gondor, and their researchers told us that their victims included people from various ethnicities. It wasn't just Amhara. They made a very distinct point of saying this. And I told this story before, so I'll tell it again. We had a guy, I swear to God, uh, I don't care who's listening. If I ever run into this guy in Europe or he, I, hopefully not in Canada, uh, or in Ethiopia, he better run because I will, I will, I will be very tempted to beat the hell out of this guy because this guy put us in jeopardy. He was acting as a kind of fixer. He, we went up to my cadre with no papers and no real media authority. He just winged it and talked his way through. We could have been sent back to Gondor. I was sick as a dog. Um, the real credit, but when we got there, the University of Gondor contact was fabulous because they had done the research. So they managed to round up victims for us to speak to. And there were scores of them. You can see in the video report, my camera person pans down the line of them, pans down the line of male victims, female victims. And I said to the team, I said, look, you guys ask questions. I have some questions of my own that I'll pass along to you. But the last thing these people need is this bold white guy in the hot sun grilling them about their experience. So the um, questions were mainly asked by Natsana Laku of Belagero TV and another journalist. Um, and they put the questions in terms of the responses. So they really interviewed these individuals. And sometimes I fed a couple of questions that I want to know. So the report came of, of that. The other thing too is people can follow Sheba Tekest. 
Uh, she was the guest has done brilliant work recently. And again, she went over there. She was traveling around for a bit with Jamal Countess. She was reporting on the mass graves that the University of Gondor found and going here, you know, and, and, and getting the stories from survivors. You know, we have survivors who like were in these places where worms were crawling under their flesh. We have these things. This is what TPLF was doing as far back as even the 80s and 90s before they were even in power victimizing these people. Um, it's very yes, complex. They got there it, on 85, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, but things were not, def uh, that was kind of de facto. It wasn't, and, and it was in their yeah. war against the dead. It wasn't de jure yeah. until uh, yeah. early 91, 92. Yeah, yeah. and the, this is, of course, this stuff is very complex. It's hard for even some of us, Ferengi, who are the so-called, like, ones who are out there to try to wrap our heads around some of these issues, which is why I defer time and again to Ethiopians to correct me or set me straight, because that's who we should be talking to and who we should be listening to. But for anybody coming at this from the outside, yeah, they're going to have a hard time because by nature, we are molded to accept. And even, even again, you guys in the states live for the past was it what are we up to now it's got to be three four years of black lives matter at least something like that something like that yeah. i mean you can go back to 2015 and the hands up don't shoot in missouri yeah yeah and yet at the same time we tolerate how many white correspondents there are in africa for mainstream media outlets. I put a whole list of them in the Gifts of Africa, the final chapter, you know, when you got Kara Anna, Declan Walsh, Finbar O'Reilly, Tom Gardner, Simon Marks, you know, I can go on and on. All these people are white. Why are they needed to go interpret Africa? If Black Lives Matter, <laughs> why is it, where, where's the disconnect there? And so why do we have these people interpreting Africa for us? And they should start with those. Why do we have Amnesty and Human Rights Watch as the go-to experts to explain Africa to us? There's a Deutsche Well article that I can pull up where the people that they spoke to for the article are Ketel Tronvel, I can never know how to pronounce his name properly, William Fungus Davison, and Michaela Ron. Not one black person, not one Ethiopian person, not one Eritrean person <laughs> is asked for that article about Africa. So, you know, what the hell are we doing? Nama Elba here is for CNN. Nama El and people can go, well, that's an African person. Or they point yeah. to Zechariah Zalela. And the thing is, these are people who are catering to the agenda of organizations which work largely on a management structure of white, New York, London, entitled editors back at the fort. Nama Elba here has a clear agenda of saying, when you tweet out and say, what's taking so long? What's the holdup in terms of punitively acting against Ethiopia? That is not an impartial journalist. That is not an objective journalist. When you have somebody who does the kind of stories that she does, you know, and I've done an entire YouTube video about the way she does her work. And her, her defense is, oh, it's misogyny. Really? That doesn't even pass the laugh test when some of your strongest critics are women, <laughs> you know, for, for Sheba Takest, for like uh, Leda Moleta, um, for other, <coughs> excuse me, for other female journalists of African descent who say, uh uh, no, no, no. How are you calling us misogynistic when we're also African women taking issue with your reports? So the whole system is gamed for lack of a better phrase, to, inc to, in to bring out a Chomskyism, to manufacture consent, to manufacture, you know, oh, well, hopeless Africa. You know, it's ridiculous. No, thank you. And, and I hope people look up all those names. Obviously, they could rewind the video when they're playing and, and catch it and, and write it down. Maybe I'll add some to the description as, as well. 
I also wanted to ask you about this fantastic video, which was your most popular video on YouTube. And it's another one that I went to to watch it again and again. I was so incredulous that you had access to this and released it because <laughs> I, I thought it was going to get taken down. And I remember, it's, I think you're you talking about the diplomats. People. Yes, the diplomats who had the uh, former TPLF ambassador. You had someone who I'd met in person at my church of all places, Professor Ephraim Isaac, who has written a book on the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And I've pointed to certain um, theological inaccuracies that he has in that book. But overall, oh. I had appreciated it. Overall, oh. I appreciated oh, it. Oh, okay. You know, but well. there are very and he he's in the beginning of the book he says all the errors are his and he's one of those people uh when i met him he was giving a talk on the oromo tradition of um either getting people involved in a offender victim uh restorative practice uh mm -hmm. where they you know eat the flesh of an animal together and they make amends even in, in murder cases or you get exiled uh from from the village and he was talking about peace and reconciliation and things like that at, at our church uh, on a on a not on a Sunday, but on a kind of off day in the uh, in the hall. I had a chance to sit at the table with him and meet him. I had you know read his articles, read his books. So I was kind of caught off guard. But I was hoping you could talk to the audience about that that video. Right now it's up <laughs> to two hundred twenty two thousand uh, uh, views. And again, I was surprised that people didn't take it down because I definitely thought they they would have. They they tried. They tried. The thing is, uh, uh, well, one sometimes like sometimes you go looking for stories, and sometimes you get lucky. Um, the whistleblowers, the UN whistleblowers, which is probably my most well-known story, isn't even my story. Um, just a little preamble about that. The whistleblowers came to me, and um, I'll tell the real story of them, hopefully in a book that I'm doing on the war, which hopefully will find a home. And though nobody believes it, it's, sorry, it's true. The thing is, TPLF uh, ripped me off. Uh, my digital recorder, and some idiots even say, who uses the digital recorder in this day and age? I do, because I don't like phone apps in terms of, of you have to subscribe and this and whatever, the, and they time out. This, I can play and play and play forever. They stole that from me at the airport. Um, and whoever swiped it, I don't think realized what they had. And so a month went by. And then they leaked an edited version, not even the real version. I can't even leak well, not leak. I can't even disclose the full version because I would need my source's permission. And that's not going to happen anytime soon. So they put out their bullshit about that and it blew up in their faces because it confirmed everything that all Ethiopians thought in terms of, oh my God, the UN really is corrupt, blah, blah. It just blew up in their faces. And meanwhile, of course, um, and people go, oh, I leaked it. And no, I didn't. What journalist in his right mind would risk being persona non grata, risk making himself a pariah by showing that you can't be trusted in terms of your sources? What fool would do that? So they did this, blew up in their faces, and on we go. And... I do different stories and store sources still come to me ironically or oddly enough, something like two weeks after that story came out, one of my main UN sources came to me with stuff about uh, UN staff getting assaulted and hurt and came to me with documents. And so life proceeded and sometimes sources give you something. A source gave me that video and with the diplomats, and it landed in my lap and I went, holy shit. <laughs> like, <"Whoa." laughs> yeah, and I'm just going. And the, the sad thing for me was um, the very, well, also the interesting thing for me was I didn't recognize Eleni. Eleni was outed by you guys. <laughs> I didn't recognize she like, she barely says anything on the full it video. If you see it, she yeah, just sort of pops up. Time. Yeah. And it was Ephraim Isaac who opens it. And I'm going, that's for that's for Isaac. What, 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 what? And I was incredibly disappointed. I was so sad to see him do this. And then my focus was totally on the diplomats. 
and it's nauseating. Did you buy as a short and aside? But sorry to cut you sorry? off before you before you get into that. Sorry, did you buy any of his post facto explanations about how he's a neutral and has invited the other side and was running through simulations on both sides and was not agreeing with anything, but just sort of uh, doing you know the black move of saying you know I'm I'm actively listening to you. Well, first of all, we got it through the same source that they went into damage control as soon as I put the video out there. So the thing is, I I apologize to the person who did this because I, I met this gentleman late, months later, briefly. Um, nice guy. And he did the show that uh, Ephraim Isaac went on like within days. And to his great credit, oh, like, yeah, he just ripped into him and just said, I'm not having it because Ephraim Isaac was trying to gaslight him with all this nonsense. And he went, nope, nope, nope. You know, like, what the hell were you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And then when you look back at previous so-called mediations of what Ephraim Isaac has been doing, you might want to question things there. No, I don't buy it at all because look at how they were talking to each other. Look at how. You know, it's nauseating, as I was about to say, to see these diplomats saying, oh, you look so svelte and you look so great. And you're and Vicki <laughs> Huddleston busy saying, you know, well, I hope you, I'm paraphrasing here, it's not an exact quote, but saying, well, you know, like, I'm hoping you'll win. And another guy basically saying, well, is there any way you can, like, take him out, i.e. Abby, without, like, the military, like, they're basically talking about, is, could you do a coup? Could you do this? Could you do, and... Jason Mosley went on Twitter and said, well, I've watched the entire video and this is much ado about nothing. I'm, that's not an exact quote, but that's what it comes to. Now, and people kept saying, oh, it's retired diplomats. Well, this is bullshit because as anybody who has spent five minutes in journalism or watched the news <laughs> or has a brain knows that retired diplomats are often used as still back channel emissaries for diplomatic missions. As a matter of fact, uh, Yamamoto makes a reference right, we found another clip where he even talks to Huddleston and says, hey, can we get, can we talk later? Because I got something happening with defense I could use you on in so many words. So they're still active. So this yeah, is going on. The Ethiopian government uses uh, former prime minister Haile Mariam Dasalik in that same way. Yeah, exactly. So this is not, this doesn't even pass the laugh test. You know, you have a group of still active diplomats, both in the EU and the United States, actively conspiring with an official of the TPLF, of a terrorist group, which is still a terrorist group on the American books. And moreover, it's the clown who's with the Uber drivers, for Christ's sake. <laughs> like, part of my language. You know, you're just going, good, this, you're is, good. this is, like, ridiculous. So, yeah, it was, it was huge. But it was a lucky break for me. The source gave it to me. And I got, what was interesting was the blowback of the report I did the next day. There is, again, I've, I've, I'd have to look up the name. But there's, a, I think it was Morgan, I forget her last name a journalist, a trans uh, journalist who actually did a little more digging on the, on the organization that sponsored their talk. And had I been more on the ball and not so frantically trying to get it out, I should have taken screenshots of it too, because all the founders went scrambling for cover because now they were implicated by uh, and there was one who's, uh, Mimi, what's her name? Who's like, was a member of, of Twitter's board, I believe if I got it correctly, um, and others. And they went, well, this is guilt by association. And my reply to that is yes, you were associated. <laughs> you were on the board. Of course it's guilt by association. You're guilty because you're associating with these people who are doing this and you should be, you should be, you should have to answer for this. And some said, well, I haven't done anything for, you know, months. And it's funny how they bailed at the very last minute, right before the attack. 
<laughs> at least on one at least one of those individuals said i haven't had any dealings with them since october 20 whatever of 2020 uh 2020 i'm going well that's interesting about a week before the attack on the on the outposts hmm hmm what's going on i mean eleni is the most interesting because she's trying to rehabilitate her image and so she's come back to twitter and I'm a nasty, curmudgeonly, petty little old man. And I will go, well, can we talk about your treason? <laughs> you know, every so often. <laughs> because it irks me. It irks me. I have a problem with people who hang out with terrorists. <laughs> you know, I have a problem with that. So I'm going, she, she's come back more than once. She, it's, a, it's amazing that she hasn't blocked me where I've gone, uh about your treason <laughs> she still hasn't you know i want her haunted for the rest of her damn days over this shit, as she should be as anybody should be why it didn't get taken down from youtube who can guess i we actually made arrangements i won't say with who to put it on a website so that had it been taken down people could still go because we've got huge forces against us i mean all the evidence points that I'm still getting shadow banned on Twitter, despite Musk's, you know, new regime. You yeah, know, I, new regime. <laughs> you know, I just got a Twitter map yesterday. I didn't even, I, I signed up for it once to actually glance at somebody else's Twitter thing. Uh, and I like now, your article, by the way, on Twitter regime change as well. We didn't yeah. get into it, but yeah, I like that too. Well, the one where everybody like ignores the fact that they don't even, they think the entire world is restricted to the United States. Yeah. And, you know, it pointed out, I just got this report yesterday that says I've lost something like 75 followers and I gained something like 60 or whatever it was. And you're going, okay. And a lot of them are suspended accounts. A lot of them clearly have to be Twitter messing with it. So that must mean that somebody with TPLF is still in there mucking around. And it's not just me, it's happening to other pro Ethiopia accounts. And we still haven't seen, uh, they don't seem in a great hurry to restore Nebu Asfa or Simon Tesfa Mariam back. Um, and you just go, okay. But what they don't realize is we have other weapons. You know, we have podcasts like this. We have, you know, I write books. <laughs> I write articles. You know, if you think that my entire, like, following is live or die based on Twitter, I got news for you. It's, you know, it ain't. You know, and, thank, and, and right, thank God. Yeah. well, we're also playing the long game. I mean, these fools, you know, I'm waiting for, you know, I nearly went on Twitter today say, now that we're sort of past the crisis point, can somebody go and clean up all the Wikipedia pages that they're manufacturing, lying about all this shit? And they do because they're trying to create an alternative historiography, which is nonsense. And so there's going to be at least two books coming out, maybe more. Martin Plout is working on one, which uh, he's a co-author of one, which I believe is supposed to come out in February. To the best of my knowledge, neither he nor his co-writer were ever in Ethiopia during the war. Once. That's crazy. Isn't that a neat trick? You can go write about, you know, <clears throat> I wrote about, I wrote Prevail. And the thing is, I can't go back in time to 1935. So a lot of his moot, but I did visit the country in 2013 <laughs> when I was busy overhauling the draft before it was published. You know, I did go to, you know, Kurdistan for the sake of my book, Winged Bull. Um, there's rumors, I don't know if it's true, that Tom Gardner is working on a book. Tom Gardner used to bitch and complain about how he didn't have access to various areas. I went to war zones. <laughs> like, uh, there are versions so, of i think his name was was it brian williams i don't know if he was on nbc or one of those who was famous for saying he was in a war zone when he was not yeah the the story if i remember the details correctly morphed over time to him seeing uh, a helicopter attack to him being in the helicopter to him and it got worse and worse as he went along and what's especially shameful about that is you know projecting yourself into the story i was thinking about this either last night or this morning it's been on my mind sheba asked me for 
Um, she was moderating, she was sort of moderating a session organized by Emmanuel Berhanu very kindly from my book signing at, um, uh, busboys and poets in Washington, DC. I love that and, place. I've been there. Yeah. It's a wonderful venue. Beautiful. But you know something, this is how stupid I am. She asked me what I went through in terms of my experience in terms of seeing like the camps and others. And I'm an idiot. It took days and days to realize who gives a shit what Jeff Pierce thinks or feels in terms of going to the war zones. What should matter is how do I make you feel by communicating the actual facts and what you saw? If I can put in your head right. the image of this camp that Jamal and I went to this, um, and I neglect the name because I got terrible short-term memory, but it's written somewhere. Um, where we're in the Afar region and I'm walking over, you know, because it's 60,000 people. Plus I worked in Brandon, Manitoba. That was 60,000 people at the time. It's hard to imagine a camp and there's broken, well, there's bottled water, you know, like plastic bottles crushed, stamped to like, you know, so you're crunching along these little, pebbled roads of garbage and bottled water and kids are running around and people got nothing to do. And so there's a little marketplace where they can go, but people are in their tents, which are UN tents. They're not even the proper Afar tents of mats, which means they're crap. So they're boiling in the heat and then they freeze at night in the cold, but Hey, the logo is on it. So you can tell where they got this crappy plastic from. If I can communicate that to you, that is far more useful than what Jeff Pierce feels. And we have to like teach ourselves, we have to teach ourselves new behavior. Who gives a shit what the white reporter thinks in terms of how he feels? What's more important is show the damn camp. Notice that every time you see a video of WFP, there's David Beasley, who, thank God, is leaving his position in, I believe, April of 2023. This guy has never met a camera he doesn't like. It's always a phone cam shot of him. I'm here in front of them. What do we need you for, pal? Show the guys loading the damn bags or show the camp or show what the need. Why do I see your big mutt face in the video? Because this is what they do. It's like white white savior has come here there i keep telling people privately and publicly that when this is all over i go away you know that's what i'm working for i fade away and i just write my history books and on i go and of course my enemies will go go away sooner like yeah fade faster <laughs> i'm here because people asked me that's a, there's a very sharp difference between what I do and what certain other people do when they insert themselves into the narrative. And this is the dangerous part is you have Cameron Hudson, you have Lauren Blanchard, you have Alex DeWall. Nobody asked these people to insert themselves into the dialogue. They just mouth off and they have influence and they pervert the truth and they are toxic and they cause damage. And then there are a couple of, our, of, you know, albeit with good intentions on our side, but even these whites don't defer to Ethiopian judgment. If you correct me and you say, this is how you pronounce your name. This is how you pronounce this name. This is how you pronounce Woyani. I take it, you know, this is what we, it's not because I'm a better person or more noble. It's what we should be all be doing, you know? And I want to see us all fade away so that it's just you guys and the diaspora and the people in Ethiopia doing your thing without us interjecting. If somebody asks me for something, then I come. But you know, other than that, shut your damn mouth, you know, and take yourself out of the process. So I'm working from my own extinction. I want to become extinct as a presence in this, you know, <laughs> so I go away, you know, That's beautiful. So, well, you know, I'll never fully go away because I want to write about Africa and others, but there you have a choice. You can either pick up the book and read it or you put it back on the shelf, but it's not, you know, I go where I'm asked. I don't go where I'm not invited. 
That's, that's the difference. I was asked by ECNIS and APAC and invited and then helped by the Rotarians. People think I'm some kind of government shill that's paid. I can tell you where my money comes from. I was paid on occasion by ECNIS. I was paid through ECNIS from APAC. I was given funds by the Rotarians. Doesn't it hurt me to say where my funding goes. Doesn't it come close to what these other idiots who were paid lobbyists were paid. In fact, look how I live. This is my bedroom office <laughs> in, in a shared apartment. You know, the idea that I'm paid by the government is hilarious because that means the government is really cheap. You know, like, so it's it's laughable. And this is this is what we have to do. When we say the neo-colonialist agenda, as Fawos and Asarade said to me, the, col the, col the colonialists never left. And I realize now he's right. And I guess my appeal, if you one wants to be generous in calling it that, is that I'm saying this. What bugs me and drives me crazy is, why the fuck aren't other people who look like me saying it? Why are there so few? You know, why are they helping you? That's what pisses me off because you could have a different Africa tomorrow. If you had other people who lo look like me go in and go, okay, let's work on this. Let's do this. Let's help them get this. And they don't, I'm, I'm, you know, there's a handful of us. I'm still up to like maybe 10 fingers that I can count the people who are allies in your cause. And in terms of a free Africa, and sometimes that's uh, that's all you need. It's uh, an irate and tireless minority it can help more people get on track. You've been uh, very generous with your time today, uh, Jeff. What I wanted to do was make sure we properly plug everywhere that you have your writings so that you could write off into the sunset uh, one day as well. Well, then so, we'll wave this around because <laughs> this is yeah. the new one. <laughs> so the gifts of Africa, that's your latest book. And do yep. you prefer that people find it on Amazon or do you have another seller that you prefer? I prefer the, the, everybody asked me that, but what I really need, if people want to help me, and I realize this is difficult for people in Ethiopia itself, mm -hmm. um, we're working on it. I promise. The thing is, is that uh, two quick notes. One, authors don't get usually to say how their books are distributed. That's up to the publisher. Mm -hmm. And it's especially true in terms of translation rights. Publishers go, those are mine, thank you. And they take the translation rights and you get a sliver of that. And to the best of my knowledge, no book of mine has ever been authorized in terms of a hark. People have done bootleg pirate versions of Prevail for which I received no money and would like to beat the shit out of the person who does it because I don't even know if it's a, a, a genuine version. I see no money from that and they're ripping me off and they're stealing from me. And they're also, for all I know, could be lying in the book. Of their version of the book for but if you want to get the authentic copy um it's better if you want to help me is to buy the hardcover and maybe in the future the paperback edition if you buy audible and there is a nice audible version of it but the thing is i make no money from that because mm -hmm. people get the subscription and then they quickly cancel it after they get the book. I Audible yeah, doesn't pay the author of that anyway. If you get Kindle, I get a tiny little slice of that. For people in Ethiopia, I'm not going to like be mad if people can get a Kindle version of that. But if you're if you're here in North America or if you're here in Europe, please buy the hardcover because then you're actually supporting an independent author. And if you From want to, Amazon. Yeah, well, they can get it from Amazon. They mm -hmm. can, if you live in the Washington, D.C. area, you can go to Sankofa yes. uh, Books. You can go to... Professor uh, Hanagiri, my store. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic shop. Love the shop. They were so nice to me. Support independent bookshops. Um, if you're in um, Toronto or in Canada, you can get through Indigo. Um, if you're in... Um, other cities, I, I've i seen it in Barnes & Noble. If you're, again, if you're in D.C., you can go down to the Museum of African Art. And there's like four nice, beautiful copies sitting on the shelf. I was surprised to see that. But, yeah, that's the best way to get it. Um, and I would also, I'm going to do a shout out for this gentleman because um, this is a neat little book. I think it's only available um off it's amazon at the center so, of the world in ethiopia yeah Can you read that I, yeah yeah it's um, name. yeah uh it's sw omamo 
Mm -hmm. um, you can get it on Kindle. Um, he would probably like hardcover too. Uh, well, well, paperback rather. He doesn't have hardcover, but um, he'd probably like the hard copy too sold. Well, go yeah, bear royalty. Um, you can still get Prevail. You can get in um, paperback. Um, you can get that from ABE Books. You can get from Amazon. You can get from various places. It's still in print. It's still doing well. There's a movie option on it, but we're, we'll see if somebody makes a movie. That would be nice. I, I hope so. We're, uh, we're looking forward to, to that one as well. And I'm actually an early adopter of some of these technologies as well. Um, are you playing with um, both Medium and <laughs> Substack? Or do, do you have a preference between where you send people, to, if you have to send people to, to one of those to catch up with your articles as well? Uh, the older articles you can only really find on Medium. I found it difficult to transfer them to Substack. They took some, but didn't take others. The reason why I went for Substack was I was advised by uh, somebody else who said, you know, if you get kicked off Twitter, you'll lose your followers and you should have a place where people can go. And Substack, not to diss Medium, but Substack is a little bit more on the ball with telling you, you got a new follower, you got a new follower, you don't get a new follower. So it was easier to sort of keep track of people that way. But uh, these days I generally publish on both. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm in talks with, um, I won't say the name cause it's hasn't approached a contract position, but I'm at a pos we're, we're in talks to do an essay book which will probably be based a lot on the articles that I wrote on Medium um, so that those will be in a nice paperback form. And I'll clean up those essays a little bit and probably write a couple of new ones um, to do sort of because I've always wanted to have an essay book. Um, but we'll probably be putting some of those more evergreen pieces into that. And hopefully that'll knock wood come about next year probably with publication, I hope later in the year or early 2024. So assuming people want that, that would be nice. <laughs> I, I yeah. hope they do. So people can find you on Medium. They can find you on Substack. They can find you in Amazon or in their local independent uh, bookstores. Uh, one black owned you named uh, the Bus Boys and Poets um, and the other one uh, Ethiopian owned as well, the Sankofa store. Um, Professor Haile Karima is a family friend. So I appreciate you had a, stuff over there as well there's um, a there's a great artist who's doing um he's going to be doing a gosh i should have his name yet gosh i'm sorry i can't pronounce his name properly he's done um where is it i'm going to yet get it um Yayu Ginnett Shitu. I apologize for mispronouncing his name. Um, he's this brilliant artist, and he's going to do a painting um, based probably on the Amhart version or part of the English version of the poem that I wrote called My Love is a Country. Um, and we want to try to find a home for that in a major institution in Addis Ababa. And if you go on Twitter and see this guy's art, it's just amazing. And I sort of gave him a plug on Twitter and we got to talking. And I said, how would you like to do this? And he thought, oh, that'd be cool. And so it's going to be this sort of three-way collaboration where there's a, another gentleman who's done the Amharic version of the poem. There's my English poem. And then there's hopefully going to be his painting. And then we got to find a home for it. So because some people like some of the poems that I wrote, um, the one I did on Requiem about the Northern attack and the one I wrote on Macadra and my love as a country is served resonate with some people who really like it. So hopefully they'll find a home too. So. Thank you for that. And thank you for doing the show and everything you've done for Ethiopia and that you will be continuing to do. I hope everyone checks out those projects. Thank you so much.